since I still appreciate you, let's find love while we may. Because I know I'll hate you when you are old and gray. So say you love me here and now, I'll make the most of that. Say you love and trust me, for I know you'll disgust me when you're old and getting... Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on Divorcing Your Mortgage. Uh, I'm your host, Mark Gertz. I'm a mortgage broker in the state of California and some other states as well. And uh, we deal with anything having to do with divorce, love, money in on this show. So it's not just mortgages. So I know some of you are... Uh, are in traffic right now, heading home for the weekend. And you're thinking to yourself, why would I want to sit and listen to a show about divorce? Well, because you never know, you know, you just never know. Um, in addition to that, we've got a great guest coming on uh, this afternoon that's gonna, that's gonna really blow your mind with some information. Um, but, you know, I was reading this article about um, the cost of divorce in California. And many of you listening to my voice are, are in the state of uh, California. Um, the average California divorce costs $14,000. You hear that? The average California divorce costs $14,000. But it can vary from there based upon the difficulty, uh, based upon the people. Um, you know, experienced lawyers are going to cost you more than... Um, and attorneys just starting out. And it's also going to depend upon acrimony. That's a great word, acrimony. All right. Are you fighting over everything? All right. Are you, uh, are you, you know, Aunt Susie's planter? I mean, you know, are, 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 how much are you going to spend per hour with an attorney to get Aunt Susie's planter? Um, but the average is 14,000. I mean, think about that. Just the average, you know, if you want to file for a divorce in California, it's going to cost you $435 just to file, all right? And then, and then the attorney fees are going to cost you close to $14,000, minimum, minimum. That's just where it starts, folks. That's one of the reasons why more and more couples who have basically decided they're going to, they've had enough, uh, they're looking at collaborative divorce or they're looking at mediation because one of the big problems in a divorce situation is that you're dividing your assets. And if you think there wasn't enough to go around when you were together, <laughs> guess what? There's going to be less to go around now that you're separate. And where it starts is that you start spending it to fight with each other. Imagine that. Think about that for a moment. I mean, just sit back for a second and let's think about that. So you're in this marriage and it's falling apart and you're fighting with each other you know, like cats and dogs. So you decide to get a divorce and then you keep fighting with each other. But the difference is before you filed a divorce, before you got the attorney, you were fighting and it wasn't costing anything. Now you're paying 500 bucks an hour for the privilege. That doesn't make any sense. That's kind of a ridiculous thing to do. Why would you want to hurt each other that badly when you're going to hurt yourself just as badly and create an enormous financial problem that might take you years to overcome, going to definitely hurt your kids. Um, folks, folks, if you're going to call it quits, you know, let's grow up and, and try to do it amicably. You know what I'm saying? Um, now, a lot of people get divorced because they want to be happy, right? Isn't that why we get divorced? because you say you want to be happy and you're, you're not happy. Well, guess what? There was a study done recently. And when I say recently, I mean within the last 12 months that says that divorce probably won't make you happier. Get this now. If you're unhappy now, there's a good possibility that even if you get divorced, you're still going to be unhappy. So, Maybe, maybe the divorce, the spouse is not the problem. Maybe the problem is you. Maybe you need to look at yourself first before you 
commit yourself to spending 14 or 24 or $44,000 to put a divorce together. You know, my, my wife and I went, went through in vitro to have our son and it took us four t- tries. And I like to say that I paid for his college education before he was even born because I spent fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 to create him. Now, that's one thing. It's one thing to spend that kind of money to create a child and to create a family for yourself, but to spend that money to break the whole thing apart, there's got to be a better way. Time to grow up. We'll talk more about this when we come back after this message. This is Divorcing Your Mortgage on KMET. I'm Mark Gertz. We'll be right back. we're back. I'm Mark Gertz, and you're listening to Divorcing Your Mortgage. I am a mortgage broker in the state of California, and we are talking about everything having to do with divorce. We've got a great guest coming on in a little while, but before she does, I want to I keep talking about uh, this, this thing, this study that was done that says divorce won't make you happier. Uh, it also says that divorce is a common side effect of ADHD. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. That's what the study says. Um, But I can't think of one person that I've spoken to in the course of my life that was going through a divorce that didn't expect they were going to be happier on the other side once it was all done. And one of the things the study found is that on average, unhappily married adults who divorce were no happier than unhappily married adults who stayed married, right? Based upon... 12 measures of psychological well-being. Um, It didn't make a difference whether it was race, age, gender. Didn't change any of that. They were still unhappy. Um, Some divorce is necessary, but a lot of divorce, maybe it's not that necessary. You know, maybe, maybe if you turn things around a little bit and you start looking for ways to compromise and find um, common ground, common ground in the present. One of the big things about relationships is you have to, at a certain point, you have to surrender the past. You have to get into the moment and deal with the reality of what you got and stop beating each other up for what you did 10, 15, 20 years ago. You know, that, that's over that's over. You know, you have to deal with the moment. Um, And happiness doesn't come from the outside in. Happiness comes from the inside, right? If you want to be happy, you have to look at yourself. And staying in the moment is a big part of that. Um, One of the problems with people and happiness and marriages is they don't think about how to make an unhappy marriage happier. Think about that for a minute. How do you make an unhappy marriage happier? It's possible. It's possible, right? Why do some marriages survive and others don't? Well, um, most couples report that they were able to compromise with their spouse. They're able to find common ground. Um, and, in, and in the passage of time, many sources of conflict and distress ease. You know, financial problems, job reversals, depression, child problems, even infidelity, it's over. Now, we can dwell on things that our spouses did to us, you know, we can imagine why they're doing it, what the purpose of it is, and, you know, whether they're trying to subconsciously gaslight us. And sometimes it's true, but a lot of times, a lot of times it's not. And it requires 
something that not very many people talk about in the course of divorce. And that is commitment. Commitment. Now, if you invest 10 years of your life with a person, 20 years of your life with a person, it's all well and good to walk away from that. But maybe the first thing we need to do is to make a commitment to try to work it out. Not to get into the blame game. We want to get away from the blame game, right? But we want to get into a situation where you're compromising with somebody. You're talking about where you want to go from here, not from what happened 10 years ago. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I got into my marriage, I was a whole different person than I am. I am now. And I see things differently. I've grown, I've matured. And um, you have to do the same thing with your spouse. You have to see them for who they are today, not who they were then. The mistakes that people make when they're younger are not necessarily the mistakes that they're gonna make when they're older. You know, that's one of the things we talk about with putting people in prison when they're in their teens about putting children into prison. It's like, would they make these same decisions if they were 25 or 35? Um, how do we turn people around? It's not always about being punitive. It's not about jailing people. And it's not about, you know, getting angry and divorcing your spouse. It's about figuring out how to make things work, how to make things work for, for both parties. Anyway. Um, on the latter part of the show, we're going to talk about financial wellness, all right, and, um, and tips for how to maintain that, all right, in a coupling situation. But in a few minutes, I'm going to bring on our guest for today, who is uh, Diane Pappas. And uh, she is a, a very impressive lady, but she's from Massachusetts, and that's where she practices. She's uh, based in Boston, in Gloucester. And uh, that's going to be real interesting for a lot of you because it'll give you a whole brand new perspective on what people in other parts of the country are going through. Um, for those of you that are seeing us online, I hope some of you Boston people are, are tuning in because you don't want to miss this. This is Divorcing Your Mortgage with Mark Gertz, and we'll be right back. And welcome back. And I'm your host, Mark Gertz. And this is Divorcing Your Mortgage, where we talk about everything having to do with mortgages in America, coast to coast. And today, uh, more than normal, that's absolutely true, because our guest is Diane Pappas, who's visiting us from uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts. She is a certified divorce financial analyst, and she helps people identify and resolve financial and tax issues that come up in divorce. And this includes verifying and analyzing all income sources, all right? Um, I just wanna get into it right away and I'm gonna let her explain some of the things that she does. Um, Diane, you and I were talking about the value of, um, of a couple, either together or separately, seeking you out before they even bring in an attorney. Can, can we yes. talk about that for a second? Sure, um, most CDFAs will recommend that people come to see us first before hiring an attorney. And the reason why is um, the same, you know, the, the old saying, if love is about, uh, if marriage is about love, then divorce is about money. <laughs> and we are trying to untie the financial knot. Therefore, you really wanna be educated and empowered and informed with the financial issues before you go to see an attorney. Because the more you know, the more informed you are as a client, the better you're going to be able to, to negotiate, make decisions that your attorney is asking you to make. Gotcha. Well, you know, we, we've spoken on this show with a, a, a lot of people that are involved in, in collaborative divorce and sometimes in mediation. Is, is that the area that, that, that you work in specifically as well? 
I work in all the different areas. Um, when someone comes to me first, a lot of times they're contemplating divorce and someone can be contemplating divorce for many years. Uh, mm. It could be 10 Ooh. years, five, you know, whatever. Uh, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a decision they make right away. It takes them time. They might reach out to me in the summertime and I might not hear again, might not hear from them again until the winter, the following winter. Uh, when they call me, a lot of times they want to know what is it going to look like? You know, they have no idea. I, I don't know what my husband makes. I don't know what we have for assets. I just want to know if I ask for a divorce, what is it going to look like? What's my life going to look like? Can I stay in the home? Uh, am I going to live in a cardboard box? So these are, you know, am I going to be a bag lady? These are the things people want to know before mm -hmm. they pull the trigger. So when they're coming to me, that's what they want to know most times. Um, and then what I can do is based on their situation, I can recommend the right attorney for them because not all attorneys are the same. Okay. Uh, you know, if like you were saying, you want to be amicable, you want to resolve your differences amicably, you mm -hmm. have to hire an attorney that's willing to do that. And that's, you know, your, your knee jerk reaction, what your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers tell you to do is, oh, you got to hire a pit bull. Well, the pit bull doesn't care about you necessarily. And they don't want to resolve the, the issues um, amicably. So that's why when someone comes to me, I'll, I will help them find the right attorney. Okay. So, um, so if they come to you first, all right, re regardless of whether it's um, a mediated divorce or a contested divorce, um, what, what do you actually do for them? I mean, I understand with referring the attorney, but um, just like the question that you posed, I don't know how much my husband makes. I don't know where the money is. You know, I don't know how many houses he has or, or, or what have you. Right. Um, wh what, where does your role come in in that? Um, so basically that I, so what I do is I gather all the data. So uh -huh. I'm basically doing my own discovery and I'm asking for everything. I'm not, well, not everything. I'm asking for three years, tax returns, W2s, most recent pay stubs, and all the most recent account statements for checking, savings, investment accounts, retirement accounts, all of the financial things that make up the marital home, you know, uh, things about re, uh, investment properties, real, right. any kind of real estate, even their cars, you know, sometimes. But we want to know what the marital estate consists of, because that's what we're going to be dividing in one way or another. So I basically have to do my own discovery. I trust, but I need to verify because right. a lot of times people categorize things incorrectly. I need to care. I need to verify people's income because a lot of times, like I said, they don't know what they make. Mm. Um, and once I put that all together, then I'm able to start the process of analyzing it. Uh, we have specific software that we use that's um, just for divorce. And so it, I can, I'm able to generate some really user-friendly reports that help people visualize it. It's not like just a spreadsheet with a bunch of numbers on it. Okay. It's really much better than that. And so it really helps people on, uh, visualize what how they might divide things because people have no idea. And they also don't understand what their options are. For example, with the marital home, you don't always have to sell it. You can continue to co-own a home after the divorce. There's mm -hmm. just some things we have to address in the separation or divorce agreement. We call it the separation agreement in Massachusetts. Other places call it the divorce agreement. Right. Um, but there, there, we, there are options. And that's basically what I am able to give people. I, I uh, inform them as to their options. I can show them what a settlement might look like based on the laws and guidelines in our state. Mm -hmm. And then help, you know, also alimony, child support or spousal support. Mm -hmm. it's called i can help i calculate that so i can show people this is what your source of income might look like mm -hmm. after the divorce this you know because right. we have to look at are there children we need to understand what the how you're going to support those children mm -hmm. and what your parenting plan is going to look like well let me let me just ask you something we had um we had attorney ty sapanic on last week who was um uh, making a distinction between separation and divorce, all right? That was this in California, and he yeah. was and he was explaining to us that sometimes people get a legal separation and they never get divorced, mm. all right? Is um, is that what you're talking about when you say separation or? 
No, no. So, so actually, we do not have separation in Massachusetts. Uh, you're either married or you're divorced. So it really depends on the state that you live in. That's something you'd have to check to see. Do you have what's called a legal separation? When I say separation agreement, that for some reason, Massachusetts calls it that, but it's really a divorce agreement. Uh -huh. We call it a separation agreement. Gotcha. <laughs> but you are either married or you're divorced. Okay. Um, in, in Massachusetts, is there such a thing as common law marriage? No. No. Okay. So, so you, Massachusetts is the same as California in that regard. Okay. They don't uh, recognize that. Okay. Um, so with all of the things that you're talking about doing for someone, um, do both spouses have to cooperate? Not necessarily. So I have a client right now who she hasn't really told her husband that she's going to be asking for a divorce. So mm -hmm. I, she can't give me any of his information right now, but right. I have tax returns and, you know, I can kind of glean what his income is based on what her income is and her W-2s. Um, so, you know, I, I am able to help her understand at least the very beginnings of what something might look like. Mm -hmm. And then we will have to fill in the blanks. Now, that being said, once we get into the process and they just, you know, both parties know what's going on, Right. Hopefully they choose to work together. And if they're going to work with me, um, it's, I like working with both parties. Mm -hmm. I like it because there's complete transparency. And that way, um, a lot of people, like, especially in mediation, obviously I'm going to work with both parties, right? But they all, a lot of people think that I might already have a bias against the person who didn't reach out to me first. Uh-huh. Well, what I always tell people is, I first of all, I am a neutral facilitator. And all of my, even when I'm working in litigation, you're going to say, wait a minute, how can you be neutral in litigation? Here's yeah. why. To me, the numbers don't lie. They are what they are. So when I'm calculating child support, alimony, when I'm dividing, you know, I'm going to do a hypothetical division of what the assets look like and divide retirement 50-50. It is uh -huh. what it is. I can't, I'm not going to skew the numbers because there's nothing to skew. Gotcha. So in that respect, I'm neutral and it always, it, it's always best to work with both parties, but I know that's not always possible. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Um, do you have, have you ever had situations where people come to you first and, uh, and after talking with you, they choose not to get divorced? No, <laughs> no that, that, that doesn't happen. Okay. No, right. they might, they might delay it. Like I've had <laughs> you know, a couple of clients that like years go by and that they must be miserable. You know, they're just afraid to pull the trigger and they're afraid to ask their husband, but I, I can't, I try to tell them, look, you know, we only really get to go through this life once. And mm -hmm. like you said, you have to be happy. Um, and mm -hmm. you, they may not be able to fix the situation. So why stay in it year after year after year? Do you, do you find that people stay because, um, um, they, they can't visualize what it's going to look on the look like, you know, afterwards, uh, because it sounds like the reason I'm asking that question is it sounds like that's a big part of what you do is at least from a financial point of view is is give them a picture of, of what life is going to look like afterwards. Yeah, because most time people just want to know, am I going to be OK? That's the biggest. Yeah. You know, where am I going to live? Am I going to be OK? What am I going to how am I going to support myself? Those are the biggest questions. Uh -huh. And, you know, attorneys are looking to just get you to the divorce. Accountants are looking at the numbers as of today. Uh -huh. Only the CDFA is looking at all of that, but then looking beyond. I see. Okay. Well, that's very, that's very important. So in other words, the distinction that you make for a CDFA is that you're looking at their life as a moving picture. Correct. You're, not looking, you're not looking at it because most people, and you're absolutely right, uh, deal with snapshots. I do that in the mortgage business. You, you know, um, I try to, I, I get a, a, a mortgage to a place and the lender says, based upon the way everything looks today at right. two o'clock in the afternoon, we'll make the mortgage. Correct. So it's always snapshots, but you're, you're a moving picture. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So you're, you're helping them visualize way into the future. Or yes. at least down the road. 
Yeah. I mean, I can go five, 10, 15, 20 years right. you know, using, using financial software. I mean, you're, you're making assumptions and whatnot, sure. but that you can tell right away when a settlement is not viable. Uh -huh. And the thing is, you know, in Massachusetts, we are an equitable distribution states and the majority of states in the country are equitable distribution states, mm -hmm. whereas California is a community property state. Right. So there's differences. You can look those up. But technically, or, or basically, when we say equitable, we don't always mean equal. So it's not always 50-50. However, mm -hmm. probably about 90% of the divorces end up being 50-50 split of all the assets. So right. there's only a few ways you can divide things. Uh, you know, you know, so it's it's 50 50 and here's what that looks like. I see. OK. All right. Um, you mentioned earlier about the fact that uh, a lot of people assume they're going to have to sell their house. Right. Right. Um, do you, you get into that with them as well? In terms oh, yes. Of yeah, and I yeah. even I even pre-qualify people, <laughs> uh, you know, for a mortgage. I mean, not pre-qualify them for the mortgage, but I show them what, you know, I, I run the numbers. I actually used to be a mortgage underwriter. Ah. Back in the day, many years ago, when rates were 10 and 11%, believe it or not. Yeah. That was back in the 80s. So I've underwritten mortgages. So I know what people are, you know, I know what they're looking for. The guidelines have changed. So, but whatever, I can still run basic things and say, well, you know, based on the numbers, you can afford to buy out your spouse. Because, right. you know, in order to buy out and, and own the house, you have to mm -hmm. refinance the mortgage to get their name off, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. So we run those scenarios because people think they, they, have, they have to sell. Um, but a lot of times, especially right now in the, in the, in mark, in the uh, interest rate economy and, and the, the market right now, sure. the real estate market as well, um, people don't want to sell. They don't want to refinance their mortgages. So right now, a lot of yeah. my clients are continuing to co-own the home after the divorce, uh -huh. which you do, we have to pay attention to a six-year time frame because that's when capital gains thing, the capital gains exclusion runs out. Uh -huh. So there's other, we have to look at some, some things, but it is very, very doable to continue to co-own the home after the divorce. And what that does, especially if there are young children, it keeps the status quo for a couple of years. Uh -huh. It helps the family adjust to the change in divorce. And believe it or not, most people, and I'm going to say probably a lot of women because I myself went through the same thing. Once you're in that home and you're, you're after a while, you're like, hmm, okay, time to move on. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is the home we were married in and it wasn't, you know, I don't want to be here anymore. Mm -hmm. And most women, all they need and men, they just need a little time to accept what's happened, to get used to the change, to adjust. And then they're like, okay, we can sell now. Time to move on. Gotcha. Um, a lot of, I mean, let's, let's call it what it is. A, a lot of men in divorce situations who stay on title, um, a lot of times they get to a place where they want to buy a house, but because, but because their, their, their name is on that house and they're, uh, they're technically obligated, they can't qualify, right? For, well, for a new one. Right. Well, we have some ways around that, at least in Massachusetts, yeah. Uh, we do have lenders who understand that. And they, as long as in the separation agreement or the divorce agreement, and again, this mm -hmm. is Massachusetts. Right. But if it says that the spouse who's living in the house, so we call that the in spouse as opposed to the out spouse. Uh -huh. If the in spouse is responsible for the mortgage payment, the principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Right. And the new mortgage company for the other, for the husband ex-husband who's trying to get a mortgage, mm -hmm. they're going to ask, we need to see six to 12 months proof that your ex-wife is paying the mortgage on that house. And so that, that works here in Massachusetts that, okay, uh -huh. the new lender sees that it's part of the court order because it says in the separation agreement, she has to pay the mortgage. Uh -huh. If she doesn't pay the mortgage and it goes into a default, the house is sold immediately. And then they're going to ask for proof that she is paying. So they'll ask for, you know, your bank savings, copies of checks, whatever it is, however you pay your mortgage. That gives them a little more security uh -huh. that he, although he's still legally obligated in case something were to happen, yeah. he may not be 100% financially obligated at this point. So so taking, taking what you were talking about just one step forward, if 
if she defaults on on the payments, all mm -hmm. right, um, and um, and it does go into foreclosure, all right, is that going to impact his credit in in such a way that he won't be able to qualify later on, even though he can prove that the um, that the in spouse was was the one who was supposed to make the payments? Well, you know, hopefully it doesn't go, it doesn't get to that, and you would want to sell the house prior yeah. to. But again, his, you know, that would show up on his credit report, right? Gotcha. Okay. But can it be explained away? I, that you'd have to talk to the okay. mortgage, you know. Okay. <laughs> I got you. All right. All right. Well, when we come back, we're gonna uh, we're gonna crank this up a little bit, and we're gonna talk about narcissistic spouses. So oh, stay so stay right with us right here on KMET. This is Divorcing Your Mortgage. I'm your host, Mark Gertz. We are our guest, Diane Pappas. And we will be back right after this. And we're back on Divorcing Your Mortgage with Mark Gertz. And uh, I'm your host. And... Uh, we have our guest today, Diane Pappas, um, who's been talking about the type of things that she can do for a couple before, hear me now, before they engage an attorney. So, um, Diane, you, you and I were, you and I, you and I were talking about narcissism, all right? Mm, yes. um, and we were talking about um, the, the, the unique difficulties that uh, on the break unique difficulties when you have a, a narcissistic spouse. Yeah. Um, can you uh, can you elaborate on that for us and and maybe share some some stories that illustrate what we're talking about here? Sure. So there are books written about it. Um, it's it is a known fact that uh, if you have a, a narcissistic spouse or one that has narcissistic tendencies, that they are going to be most likely very difficult to go through the divorce process with. Um, a lot of times, some of them uh, feel they're above the law. And so like these things don't apply to them. Um, a lot of them have control issues over the spouse. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, maybe there's other personality traits getting lumped in there, you know, mm -hmm. because we have control issues going on. Uh, and then you, you, we also have the people that behave one way in front of me mm -hmm. and a completely different way the way they're treating their spouse when they're not with me. Let me let me interrupt you for one sec because because I know you and I were talking off uh, offline. Um, you've done over four hundred cases, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, when we're talking about narcissistic spouses, we're we're talking we're talking mainly about about the husband. Yes. Okay. Um, can can you uh, can can you explain that to us or or where that comes from and in terms of what we're talking about here? Um, you know, I, I don't, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't really, I can't really speak to that because that would be more of a, like a psychologist or, you know, someone that has that type of knowledge and experience. So I wouldn't, it's just the experience that I have had in yes. my cases and the fact that we do know that narcissistic tendencies can be, can play a very difficult role in the divorce process mm -hmm. because they're unable to work together to find resolution, you know, resolution to common issues. It's always a very positionally, a position, positional based type of divorce. You know, they take a position mm -hmm. and they are unwilling to change. Very, very rigid. Very rigid. Yes. Gotcha. Um, and, and, um, uh, and, and your experience, I mean, I can understand that in terms of uh, a lot of men being controlling in these situations, um, especially a lot of what I'll call traditional marriages yes. uh, that harken back to a time when, when the man was bringing in the money and the woman was, was taking care of everything uh, in the house. Um, do, do you find that it's that stereotypical or do you find this type of narcissism in, in more modern marriages too? Mostly in the, in the marriages that are uh, where the people are in their 50s and above uh, okay so not so much that's that's not not so much the millennials okay like, you okay know, good they're not good they're not really they're not getting divorced yet <laughs> <laughs> um so i you know i'm seeing this in 
in the in the older uh, I don't want to call them gray divorce, but they do say anybody over 50 is a gray divorce. Well, yeah. I don't have gray hair <laughs> and I'm over 50. But um, uh, the uh, the other thing, too, is that women who are the who are the ones that have the money, because now I am seeing uh, women who make more. Uh-huh. So that is not your traditional role. They have a very hard time. Have to having to split their their assets with their husband, mm -hmm. and so whereas a man kind of knows, or yeah, he knows he's going to have to split his four hundred one k, right? But a woman who has more, and maybe the man doesn't for whatever reasons, the husband doesn't. She has a very difficult time with that. She has a mm -hmm. very difficult time with having to think about paying her husband alimony, mm -hmm. and that's because the traditional roles were flipped. Because she not only maybe is she the breadwinner, but most likely also the caretaker of the home and the children. Mm. So I, what I hear very often is, well, I've done everything and he's done nothing and he gets half of everything. Mm. But then I'm like, but, you know, what about the stay at home mom? You know, if the shoe were on the other foot. So it, it just it's it, that's kind of fascinating to me. Um, you know, that men understand that, yeah, they have to split the 401k. Women have a very hard time with it. Very interesting. Um, uh, any thoughts on why that is, or it just an observation? I just think women, because they became the breadwinner, they sometimes might feel their husband was lazy mm. or he didn't work as hard as he could have. And these are their ideas, not mine. <laughs> I understand. I just think it's, it has to, I think it really goes back to those traditional roles again. And when we're not used to the traditional role, that's when things kind of get out of, you know, Ooh. they don't, they don't roll right. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. You know, you, you mentioned, you mentioned pensions a couple of times there. And, um, and one of the things that I was really curious about, because I have to confess, I really do not know very much about CQS. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I really don't know that much about Quadro as well, all right? Because okay. it's not yep. usually something I get involved in. Um, I really want to. I really would like you to elaborate for us on on this new designation and uh, and your specialty in regard to uh, divorce and pensions. Sure. So a a uh, CQS is a certified Quadro specialist, and you're going to say what's a Quadro? So that's short for Qualified Domestic Relations Order. That is the a legal document that has to be drafted and submitted in court that uh, divides an employer-sponsored retirement plan. So uh, there's two types of plans. One's called a defined contribution plan. That's your 401k, 403b. And then you also have private pensions. So like uh, the big companies, Bose, uh, IBM, GE, they have pension plans mm -hmm. and they still, they still have them. So those, those plans get divided by this document called a quadro. Then on the other hand, we have state pensions. Like we have in Massachusetts, we have the teacher's pension right. and we have the state employees, uh, people who work for the city, the town, and the counties. They're most likely involved in the state pension plan. Those also get divided by a document called a domestic relations order or a DRO. So we have a quadro and a DRO. <laughs> mm. And so I am able to draft that legal document. You do not have to be an attorney to do it. I draft that legal mm. document to make sure that the client's uh, rights and entitlements are protected. And, and also I do it to protect the attorneys as well. I got you. So, so who brings you in to do that? Um, a lot of times the attorneys know I do it, so they hire me. And then uh, a good thing about what I, the work I do, I if I'm working with the client in mediation or collaborative, they typically will use me to also do that. Great. So if if our uh, if our audience wants to get a hold of you to talk to you further, what's the best way for them to um, to get to do that? They can email me. Uh, my email is Diane, D-I-A-N-E, -E, at solutionsfordivorce.com. My website is solutionsfordivorce.com. All you have to do is just Google Diane Pappas, and I will show up. <laughs> okay. So 
Pretty easy. And I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Terrific. Well, I really, really appreciate you spending the afternoon with us uh, for a little while. And that's great information. And I hope you'll uh, consider coming back again. I'd love to. Wonderful. This is Mark Gertz. This is Divorcing Your Mortgage. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Divorcing Your Mortgage. I'm your host, mortgage broker, Mark Gertz. We talk on this show about anything having to do with divorce coast to coast. And uh, to prove it, we had a guest today from all the way out in Massachusetts. Diane uh, gave us some great tips uh, on ways to save money on your divorce and also to get the information you need before you make that final, final, final decision. All right. Um, I came across an article about uh, taxes and alimony that was um, a little surprising because you probably think just like I do that if you get divorced and you have to pay alimony, you get to deduct that off your taxes, right? And your spouse has to claim that as income on his or her taxes, depending on who you are or their taxes, if you want to get non-binary about it. Um, well, guess what, folks? Uh, that's not the case anymore. Uh, let me read this to you. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act also affects new changes to divorce agreements signed before January 1st, 2019. In particular, alternations to the original agreement may change the tax impact of alimony payments. If your divorce papers are modified to explicitly spell out that the repeal of the deduction for alimony payments applies, Payments under your divorce agreement will be taxed according to the new rules. Let me explain that to you in a minute. Without any modification, the alimony payments for agreements entered in a prior to January 1st, 2019 are typically deductible by the payor and taxable income to the recipient. That's the way most of us have always thought about it. The person that pays gets a deduction. The person that receives has to claim the taxes on, on their return. Well, guess what? Starting January 1st, 2019, that was no longer the case. As a matter of fact, to be specific, what it says is, is that you that are paying don't get a deduction and you that are receiving don't have to claim it as income. It doesn't even have to be reported on, ta on federal tax returns anymore. Now, what I just read you says is that if you got divorced prior to January 1st, 2019, and then you go back and you modify the agreement, The, the new agreement, the modification, now brings you past January 1st, 2019, and your tax status changes. So if one spouse was deducting and one spouse was claiming income and you modify the agreement, that doesn't apply anymore. So you need to be careful what you do. In addition to that, you also have to keep in mind that that doesn't affect state law, state law. So for example, in California, even though you can't deduct the alimony that you pay on your federal taxes, you can deduct it on the state taxes. And your spouse is supposed to claim it as income on your state taxes. And if you don't do it, they're gonna, they could put penalties there, all right? So you have to keep that in mind that that can, that can happen in a divorce situation. And that's only been for the last four years. Who knew, all right? Um, in addition, the other thing that you might want to keep in mind is that that's a big decision when you're going to make a divorce in terms of understanding the economics of it. Because if you're the spouse that's going to have to pay alimony and you're figuring in that you're going to deduct that, if you're figuring that you have to pay your spouse, like let's say two grand a month, that's $24,000 a year. That's a nice deduction off your taxes. But now you can't deduct it off your federals. All right. It's just money that you pay to to support the family. Um, so important considerations. And that's one of the reasons why you want to consider working with somebody like Diane Pappas before, before you consult or engage an attorney. All right. Um, one of the big problems in divorces is that people don't accurately investigate what things are going to look like after the divorce is over. 
And then they're in for a shock because it's not the way they thought it was going to be. The economics are no longer the way they think it was going to be. And what a CDFA like Diane does is she helps you to visually see what the next three, five, 10, 15 years of your life is going to look like without your husband or your wife. Okay. That's, that's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big deal. Okay. So financial wellness tips. Let's talk about that. Um, this particular article, which was written by Samantha Netkin, talks about these in relation to the bride. But I think they apply across the board. I don't think it matters uh, whether you're male or female, whether you're the bride or the groom, or the bride and the bride, or the groom and the groom. I, I don't think that matters. Um, and it's really interesting stuff that she's talking about here. Um, number one, She's talking about having the right attitude. Let me, let me, let me read you what, what she says. There's, there's a lot of new things happening in this situation. With every new beginning, the first place we want to start is having the right attitude. It's best to think of the wedding as a financial project with various subtasks as opposed to approaching it as one giant undertaking. Heading into the planning process with that mentality may help it seem more manageable and alleviate feelings of being overwhelmed. Now, what's interesting about that is that applies whether or not you're planning a marriage or whether you're planning a divorce. Isn't that interesting? Having the right attitude, the way you go into something, visualizing what your future is gonna look like and getting the help to do that is what this is all about, whether you're coupling up or coming apart. Well, I appreciate you being with us today. For those of you that are sitting in traffic, getting home for the weekend, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is KMET. I'm Mark Gertz. You've been listening to Divorcing Your Mortgage. We'll be back next week, same time, same place, AM, FM, and on the internet as well. Thanks for joining us. Really enjoyed spending time with you this afternoon. I'll never love you then at all the way I do today. So please remember when I leave in December, I told you so in May.